Mike Sintek, Product Involvement Representative for the US 298 Corridor, uh, who's visiting from here from the local office of H HMTV. Thank you so much, Marco. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I work with the US 290 program on the public involvement side. I work for HMTV and we're the program management consultant to Texas on the project. And uh, nice enough to come from our home office in Kansas City is uh, Mr. Austin Reed. He is a senior 3D animation specialist, and I can tell you pictures tell a thousand words. If a picture tells a thousand words, an animation tells a hundred thousand. And Austin's going to talk to us about how we can use these, how h and and other companies use these to communicate with folks each and every day through programs all across the United States. So let's welcome Mr. Austin Reed. Thank you. Well, Hello everybody, my name is Austin Reed and I'm from the uh, H&TB Kansas City office, uh, downtown Kansas City. It's where the headquarters is at. And I've been in H&TB since 2006. When I arrived in 2006, uh, visualization was kind of still really new. Visualization has been around in the AEC market since around uh, the mid-1990s. So when I got to H&TB, they asked me two things. We need better quality and we want to go real time. And a lot of people will say, what's real time? You guys play video games, have kids that play video games? Real time is where you're able to walk around in an environment, see what you want to see, and interact with it, get immersed in it. Well, h &TV had very little technology with that. And they came to me, and the reason why they hired me is because I went to Full Sail University in Orlando, Florida, where I got a degree in computer animation for video games and film. So. The first thing I looked at is how am I going to do this? Because all my clients were freelance. I worked for as web design. I did some stuff with Atlanta Braves, Cincinnati Reds. It's all visual stuff. But how do I do something that's accurate for engineering and accurate for uh, architects? So I was luckily to be in the incubation department where I did art research and development. And now, here in, two, in, 20, in 2010, I got promoted to the National Sales Office where I got to put all my research and development into practice. So today there's four uh, topics we're going to go over. How to communicate using 2D and 3D to your clients, to the people that you're working for, to show them, demonstrate exactly what you need to give them so they understand your project and your ideas. Second thing we're going to talk about is tools. What kind of tools that we use to make sure that uh, your designs get out to the public. They uh, convey the message to the board members, to the city council, but most importantly to the people. And the third thing is, is the process. It's going to be kind of technical, but I could keep it very entry level just so you understand how we start from A and go all the way down to Z. And then I'm going to wrap everything up with innovations and how I see the AEC market moving in the next five, ten years. Quick background with HTB, we've been around since the early uh, 1900s. Uh, we are one of the original companies with the inter uh, interstate system. Our first big project was the Tollway in New Jersey, and uh, Tolls helped fund the company, and it continued to help fund our company through uh, various uh, revenues at KDOT, uh, TexDOT, uh, Massachusetts, all over the country. We use uh, tollways and r bridges and highways to uh, give us our revenue stream. We're also into architecture where we do sports stadiums such as the new uh, San Francisco 49 ers stadium that should be uh, ready to go by the 2014 or the 2015 season. So first thing I talk about is low-end animation. Low-end animation is something that you just need to get your message out quickly and when I mean quickly I'm talking in a week. Okay, As you can see it's very raw. It's just mesh shapes, just the water flowing, doesn't look like water, but it conveys the meaning. As the water continues to flow over, and this is for a sewage plant, uh, it gave everybody a good idea what it was going to be, but we only spent a week. So let's move to the next phase. This was a uh, seismic retrofit that we did around the uh, San Francisco area the, for the Dumbarton Bridge. Uh, this here is a mid-level. It's a lot more polished, it looks more realistic. But mid-level lacks a lot of the exterior stuff, as you would see 
fishing boats and barges and all that stuff moving on the water. Um, we kept the, the camera ver really tight, so we just focused on the bridge itself and the road system. So that, and, and in the horizon, there would be the mountainous area around San Francisco. Now, this is what we like to do. This needs two months of work. The last one you saw, saw a month. So we, we're gradually seeing one week, one month, to two months. This is two months, two people, full time. And this was built from scratch. Everything's from scratch. We got on Google Earth, Bing, and we downloaded photos that people put up on Flickr, uh, Snapfish, the, the Facebook, wherever. We just went to Google, Bing, we searched really hard to figure out how this area looks without having any CAD data, any engineering details. And this is showing uh, the new light rail system that's being developed in uh, San Antonio that's going in front of the Alamo. A lot of people were concerned with this project because it's a landmark. If we put a light rail system in front of the landmark, you're not going to get that iconic family shot you know, from a far distance with the Alamo in the background. As you can see here, the cars are moving a little. Uh, they're all hand animated. The uh, animation, that if you guys were here about five minutes ago, I had looping. Um, the cars were floating. Somebody knows the cars were floating. Those were actually animated by, by us. They're hand, they're hand animated. Uh, Agent TV, we uh, created a, a software using uh, VizSim. You guys, anybody familiar with VizSim? Traffic simulation? Well, we have a uh, in-house plug-in that we can take realistic VISM data and it can control traffic, stops, wrecks, and I don't have to animate that, which is good because now I can spend more time with putting detail and bringing more re realistic character to everything. Some other examples, as you can see the one on the right is the example that I showed earlier. Um, that, that took two and a half weeks, whereas Alamo had more detail and that took two months. The one on the left is a, a massing model that we can also, you can also do artistic stuff. You don't always have to go photo real. You can keep it very conceptual, hand sketchy. Uh, we went for more of a watercolor look to it. When you're done with your 3D uh, content, and a lot of people say, I want something to give to a client as a thank you, or I want to put it in a lobby. Um, you can, it's very easy to take any 3D geometry that you created for your animations and create a physical model. This is a 3D print of a pier, pier leg and the uh, bridge cross section of a light rail system down in Honolulu that we're working on. And uh, I can pass that around. Uh, you guys can look at it, get all the uh, grease and get stuff on it if you want. <laughs> but you can do anything from full water stations to individual piers. Um, you can do uh, mass transit buildings, you name it, you can put it. We've even done leave behinds at uh, when we have uh, HNTV officers meeting. The officers each got an HNTV 3D print um, that had HNTV logo on it. So you can, whatever you want to do, you can pretty much print it. What file format? Uh, well, for this company here, it's a Z print. So you uh, can create in 3D Studio Max, Maya. Uh, make sure it's a solid model, and then you can kick it out as an STL, or for me, I, uh, I use uh, Collada, FBX, it's, uh, the company that we use is called Z Corp, they're out of Boston, and there's a lot of local vendors here in town, if you look for them, that will actually uh, use Z Corp, because Z Corp is the only uh, company right now that's full color 3D prints. Um, a lot of times you just see like a plain white model, which is great for architecture. But if you want to show more of a final design, uh, Z Corp is the only one. It's basically what happens is they have a, a powder substance and it puts a little glue on top and it goes layer by layer. In the last three layers, it actually uses HP ink. And it, so basically, instead of printing ink on paper, it's printing ink on powder. And you get a full detailed model. The next thing that uh, I want to talk to you about is uh, photo matches. Yes, they're, they're great. They're very powerful. 8 to 16 hours turnaround time. You can convey what your bridge is going to look like. You can show what the light rail system is going to look like going through downtown. If you have a low budget and you need something fast, photo matches are the way to go. <coughs> the next step to that is doing animated photo match. 
Just because you have a static still doesn't mean you can't bring it to life. It would be no different than having your cameraman sit on the corner just filming traffic go by. You can do the same thing in 3D space. Take your shot, make your back plate like they would do in the Hollywood movies, and then animate your light rail system or your cars or a building being built. This is a quick turnaround, same thing, 8 to 16 hours. Now we're going to talk about 2D visuals. 2D visuals can help uh, showcase a lot of things. You can do overlay maps that show uh, potential streets, uh, bus stops, or uh, road alignments. They're a good tool to uh, use during uh, pursuits to show the clients exactly what your vision is. To me, this is one of my most favorite things. I think it's a lost art form. Working at engineering architecture, uh, you, can, you can find a lot of designers who have this ability. <coughs> For me, I'm a 3D guy, I can't hand render. But just looking at a hand sketch with either colored pencil or markers or crayons, it can really bring something to life rather quickly without having to do a full-blown 3D animation. So, even though it's kind of an old art form, don't forget it because to me, that, that can show you exactly what you're going to show in a short time frame. At HMTV, we've also uh, developed a new technology for displaying. Instead of printing boards, we have HD TVs that we can do vertical or horizontal. And we can go through slideshows instead of printing out board, board, board. It's just in the keynote, PowerPoint file. It's very, very powerful, and it only takes 10 minutes to set up. So now I want to uh, talk about public involvement, and this is a local project that you guys would be familiar with. Uh, this is Harrisburg, and this was an animation that we created uh, to show what the uh, new train system and new roadway is going to be like. Unfortunately, we didn't get to show this during the uh, interview, so we turned it into a, a flip book. You remember when, back in the 80s when they were really popular? We used to snap them real fast and you could see cartoons spinning. I say 80s because I'm an 80s kid, but they've probably been around a lot longer than that. So we took uh, an animation file and we sent it to the, the print company and said no problem. And all they did was take an AVI or WMV uh, file format and then they turned it into a flip book in two days. And I thought that was really remarkable. And I'm going to let Mike come up and talk about uh, construction management on the uh, uh, right here. Of, uh, this is actually Harrisburg, but he can kind of talk to how we do this for his project on US 290. Yeah, one of the, <clears throat> the things that we'll see if coming up here in a minute, but you're seeing what anytime you have a picture, it makes it a lot easier to understand. This is similar to what we do with our presentation slides. Our projects at the 610-290 interchange are so complicated, it's hard to see in one fell swoop. I call it like trying to eat a pizza without cutting it into slices and putting it all in your mouth. You can't do it. It's very difficult. So what we're able to do is take different pieces, take pictures of them to use, very similar to this. We'll put these on slides, and they can stay up for a while, and they're frozen. In a sense, it's like the way a still picture can be powerful, kind of like the way like the way one of the things that the power of still pictures of people are so into video now. You know, there's YouTube, people want to see it on television. It's not so much a picture. But this, the picture, this, when I think of the, the 1980 Olympic hockey team, I don't think of the video. I think of the style of Sports Illustrated. Frozen pictures like this allow you to see what's happening at that moment. So you can freeze it like this and we can go over, hey, this is where, here they're talking about a retaining wall. Here's where it is and it's in relation to this wall. And this is this that way it's not moving. Because what's just happening is if you have a video, as powerful as the animation is and as wonderful as it is, there are times where people want to stop and look at it in freeze frame. So that's where this can come in. All right. Another tool that, uh, that we're looking at is construction management using 4D. Uh, it's a big buzzword right now, 4D, 5D. It's 3D plus cost plus time. Uh, this is using one of our uh, TrueVis immersion technologies. It's a real-time application that we can create a slider and you'll see the 3D building, you'll see the time and the cost. It's uh, driven by uh, .NET, uh, C-sharp. Um, 
Luckily at Asian TV we have a lot of in-house programmers that can help us with the, uh, the scripting on this. But it's a very powerful tool that you can walk around in real time and understand uh, construction sequencing plus how much it's going to cost on a particular day. And it's also good to show construction workers what they should be working on that day. A lot of times they come to work, that's just their work. They, they don't really know about the project. So this is a way for construction managers to really engage the, the contractors who are working there, construction workers, so they can see exactly what's going on. Another good thing about this technology is we can add in boring log data, utilities. So if you want to see where all the utilities are, we can click a button and it'll give you a rough general uh, idea where the utilities are. If you don't understand, understand what kind of soil is going on, you can click on the soil log and then right there it'll call up page 253 of a PDF and you'll know exactly in that location what soil is being in that area. And then here's a final design practice. Mike, you want to talk about your yeah, project? This is a, a video that we're very familiar with. This is, uh, this is online at mikesnoni.com. Here is, this is the new ramp, the yellow, that's coming from Interstate 10. The purple ramp up here <laughs> is the one uh, coming from Interstate 10, and this is a shot now. This is looking north, this is looking south. There's a Sheraton Hotel in the middle at the top. And the big feature of the interchange is the separation of traffic, those ramps coming to and from 10. And we can talk about that over and over and over, and folks will look at us and like say, what are you talking about? You show them this in a presentation, they get it. They get it, they know where they are. Here's Northwest Mall. And then there's HISD, there's 18th Street, there's Whataburger, and these are invaluable. Once you, you again, there are times when you want to stop, you can you freeze a certain, you freeze the animation, or you can have, like, we have different pieces on different slides for presentations to talk about one piece stop where the animation is and it's not moving. But when people can see this, and they're able to play it a couple of times, once we'll play, the presentation will play it once. People look at it, they get a sense of, okay, this is kind of the lay of the land. And then we'll go back and there are times when we we'll, we'll replay it and we'll stop it. But without these pictures, we can talk all day about direct connectors and elevations and what's the height of the connector going to be, where's the exit ramp. Whew, you talk to folks and you might lose them. But you have this animation, it's something they can relate to and understand. And I can't tell you how often we get compliments on this. Um, we have this, uh, there's animation, this is, is on our website. We also have one at OA, but they're excellent tools. So this model was made with, uh, with um, This model was uh, made by the 3D team and the Plano office, oh, yeah. and uh, they took all the. They they actually like to work in CAD. Oh, okay. they, they start in CAD, and they have everything drafted up by the engineers or themselves because they have a engineering background. Whereas for me, I have a computer animation background, so they get they did a lot of the CAD work themselves. And then they brought in 3D Studio Max and then uh, did all, all the animations out of Max. But they do most of their modeling is straight inside of AutoCAD. So, great question. So now I'm going to talk to you about the tools that I use, the Plano team uses. It's kind of a firmware implementation that we're trying to push out to everybody. So for 3D, everything at the top means everything to the company. You got V8i, which is MicroStation, we got AutoCAD, and we got Revit. That's where I would like to see all the 3D being done. So I can focus on, let's make it look cool. So if everybody else is focusing out either in MicroStation or AutoCAD or Revit, it's accurate data. So if a client comes back to us and says, you know, what, how big is this room? And I can just open up the model and I'll know. I've kind of put SketchUp up there as well because a lot of our architects actually use SketchUp in the very early design phases instead of using AutoCAD. So I kind of put it in a pseudo AutoCAD BIM realm. To me, it's not really 3D. I don't use it. I, I just kind of let the architects play with it and then I'll bring it through to Studio Max. Our pipeline is a very unique one. A lot of Offices are like, you can only use 3D Studio Max to do your 3D. No, you can only use Maya, or you can only use Cinema 4D, or you can only use Softimage. There's no need. If you're going to bring in a new kid from college, why put handcuffs on them because they learned something else? Give them the tools they need and let the people like myself, who are the senior leads, take that 
uh, data and bring it in. A polygon is a polygon. It's just a mesh. So let them work efficiently in what they are. You're not spending time training them because they're familiar with the project because they learned that software in, in college. So then when we take them through to Studio Max, we go to their client and says, well, what's our final output? Do you want an animation? Do you want a 3D print? Do you want a video game? Okay. So the one on the, on the right, we use After Effects for all our compositing work. And then from there, if we're going to do a keynote presentation, we'll put it as an MP4 so it plays well on the Mac. If we're going to go on Windows, we'll make it a WMV. If we're going to go a uh, real-time route, we use uh, a program called Unity. Unity is a really big game development uh, software out right now because it's very compatible with PCs, Macs, Xbox 360, PS3, Wii, and most importantly now, iPad, iPhones, and Android. Everything's on the go. So you can give it to your contractors, put it on their iPad, and take it out, and they can use it on the field. No worrying about carrying around heavy laptops and worrying about if you're going to have a connection or not. You know, give them a really nice uh, iPad that has a 4G connection using the new iPad. It's got a built-in graphics chip that's extremely capable of doing everything that you would ever want in an AC market. The 2D tools that the uh, 2D graphic designers at HMTP, they primarily work in the Adobe Suite, and that's all they use. Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. And then they gotta figure out the, the input or the output, whether it's gonna be Flash, Keynote, or PowerPoint. We primarily use Keynote because uh, we use a, a Mac to drive our presentations because of quality and that it can really push out the multiple monitors at once. The reason why I'm using a PC today is for the innovations aspect uh, that I'll be showing you later and you need a really beefy PC to actually run. So how do we get from point A to Z? Well the first thing is you got to sit down with your clients and figure out what they want. When you figure out what they want, they really don't know what they want. You need to come back and tell them what they need. Okay? A lot of people, they have, uh, they have an idea and a vision, but you need to take the next step. So what we do, we sit down with our clients, we ask them about what they want, and we'll, we'll say, well, we'll get back with you in one or two days. And then we'll decide, this is what they want. They want a high end visualization, but they got a small budget. All right? Well, we gotta come back and tell them, your budget's here, and you want this. And we come to a middle ground, and we'll end up with a mid-level. Which is fine, because we're telling a story, it's high detail, and we're focusing just on their project and we get the point across. As soon as we get everything nailed down, we, have, we get the scope done, we get everything finalized, it's time to have some fun. The first thing I'll do is go out and go get some aerial images. That's the foundation for every project. We use MapMart. Um, you can go to mapmart.com or just Google them. They're out of uh, Denver and they used to, uh, they're in connection with uh, Global Mapper, uh, a company that uh, takes exact uh, rectified imagery in coordinate space and then we can bring that in this 3D Studio Max. And when I have my aerial images, I can fine tune exactly where the project site is and then I can start developing trees, landscaping, existing structures because while I'm doing that, our engineers and our architects are working on the accurate data for the actual project. And when they're, when they're done with that, I gather all that plus any existing data we may have from an exist, existing project and bring that inside of 3D Studio Max. As you can see here on the right hand side is the, uh, an image of what a project looks like in 3D Studio Max. It's we've got a wireframe. A lot of engineers actually like the wireframe look. They don't, they don't care about the detail. They want to see their project. They want to see the, the rolling terrain or they want to see the guts of the building. So when it's time to create an animation, we don't just create the animation, we create a previs first. This is a previs, pre the one on the right is the, the kind of final version, but we take the previs and we take it back to the client when we're about halfway through so they can see progress. But we have to warn them, this is not the final product. This is what we are envisioning for your final product. 
So the one on the left, it's got the Kool-Aid colors, Mardi Gras, it's really fun, festive, that's viewport rendering. The one on the left took a few hours. The one on the final animation on the right, a few days. So we can do very, uh, we can do as many iterative steps and process with the client. A lot of times we don't even have to go to their office, we can do it remotely. There's great software using WebEx or Bridget. Um, so you can have you know, teleconferences and you can do the stuff inside 3D Studio Max without any lag. And so they can mark up on our screen exactly what they want fixed. Do they like the camera? No, let's, let's uh, animate it this way. Or we need to add another camera this way. So we have a, a lot of collaboration with our clients early on. So when we do hit the final render, bu render button at the end, it's what you get on the right. And that's what they wanted the whole time. So it's very, uh, it's very, very essential to get the previous to them about halfway through the project. And then you can come back and start tweaking that stuff. And then when it's time to uh, uh, finish the lighting, we either go into the compositing realm like I talked about, or if we're gonna go the real time route, we have to set it up so it's ready for the game environment or to do a final 3D print. Our graphic design team uh, they basically work on proposals first. They get all the data that they need from uh, either the engineers, the architects, or the clients. And then what they do for the proposals, they spit that data back out uh, for the pursuit. And then they're also in charge of making sure that the multiple displays are set up. They're our tech team. We, send them, we always send a, at least one or two of us to the presentation to make sure everything goes right. Because it's our, our equipment we typically bring in and bring out. And this is a, uh, an example of side-by-side -side, uh, screens that we use. They're 250 inches. Um, now you can get you know, 60 inches, and it'll still look small in this room. So what do I see coming here in the future? Well, first off, we're looking at the new, does anybody have an Xbox here? Raise your hands if we've got an Xbox. Does anybody know what the Xbox Connect is? No. Xbox Connect. It's kind of like the Wii. Instead of having a remote, the Kinect is actually sitting at your TV looking back at you. And it's got, uh, it's shooting lasers at you. And if, if you would turn on the Kinect and turn off the lights, you see millions and millions of small red points. Well, the Kinect is actually capturing you in 3D space. So it's kind of hard to tell. Um, right here, these little dots. These dots here represent bones. So if you guys play a, a really popular game for the, the Xbox Connect, it's called Dance Central. My wife is not a gamer, but she'll play Xbox Connect because she can dance and it's, act like, it's like you're dancing. So we're actually trying to figure out how we can use Connect to take it to our project sites and use it to capture existing data. So say <laughs> that we're gonna replace a bridge pier and we wanna see the existing first, we can actually take the Kinect, hook it up to a PC, and, th and make it think it's like a LiDAR machine. Are you, anybody familiar with LiDAR? So instead of flying it or having an you know, expensive team come in and drive it, we can just hook up a Kinect, walk around it, capture it, and then we can multi multiply it out on, depending on where it's at in the site. The next thing that we're looking at, or actually trying to implement, um, it's interactivity during presentations. Instead of talking to slides, we can actually touch the slides. And what I mean by touch, you can physically turn any projector, any space on the wall, into an interactive object. So if we were here to project this same screen here, there's, n there's nothing here. Right now, it's, it's static. I can't do anything. Well, we developed some software um, we, we took some existing software and we enhanced it. So I can turn this projector into a touch screen in about 10 minutes. Next thing a lot of people are gonna start asking you or if they're not already asking you, how do I get it on the iPhone? Or how do I get it on the iPad? Or how do I get it on my Android tablet? Well, you need to start looking at that because the days of laptops, they're about gone. Steve Jobs was right. You can put so much on the small tablet and do everything that your clients need them to do on site, it's phenomenal. 
You can have internet, you can have your projects, you can have all your data at the touch of a, a touch screen that's about that thick. No more carrying, carrying around something heavy. So if you guys are looking at public involvement tools, this is also a great way. They can come to the public involvement meeting and they'll be connected to your local Wi-Fi. They can download the files and while they're, while they're at the public involvement meeting, they can be walking around in the environment or seeing a video of the new project. So you guys really need to start looking at Android and iOS uh, applications. So for me, having the game background, this is where I really, really think it's going. If you can take something really high and powerful, long, long are the days where you used to have to sit and wait. The last animation we did took 14 days to render. And that was only for two minutes of animation for the pursuit. Two minutes, 14 days. CEO comes and looks at us and goes, you need a big render farm if we have two projects going on. How can we get the same quality and cut that time in half? Well, the technology is finally here and it's finally cheap enough and the game industries are finally releasing it to the AEC market instead of having proprietary that you can use this to play around. Two weeks time, myself and uh, one of the other guys on my team <coughs> took your US 290 project and we have it where you can play around with realistic graphics. And I encourage you guys after the uh, meeting to come up and test drive it yourself. Let's go have some fun. Xbox 360 controller. So all you need to go and have a good time. You can pass this around, the public involvement meeting. If you're afraid that somebody's gonna take it away, 30 bucks. Somebody takes it, 30 bucks. No big deal. Drop in the bucket. But if I can walk around in, my, in this environment, free will, I can get in the car and drive around and take a look at the project, <coughs> drive on the wrong side of the road, <laughs> but so now instead of having a static video where Mike is up here pointing at stuff Mike you want to come out and point at uh, something that looks familiar to you in case you're wondering everything works because we're game nerds we got lights working we got fist we got guns <laughs> we got we got Jersey Barrier damage. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So yes, we we, we we actually we can get rid of that. We can zoom in on uh, aspects of the bridge. But this is two weeks of development. If we had uh, two months of development, we could have Whataburger. We could have Sheridan. We could have everything that you ever imagined, and instead of me waiting 14 days to have this two-minute clip, <coughs> Mike could be driving the simulation. And he goes, you know what, I don't want to drive this anymore. Push a button, and then the camera does itself. So the uh, possibilities are endless. So we have iPad development, we have Xbox. We're using Kinect for mobile LiDAR. These are technologies that are going to continue to develop. Microsoft is spending lots of money on the new Kinect coming out. Right now, the, the LiDAR is only, it's only shooting a 640 by 480 uh, aspect. Before long, it's going to be able to ca capture, the, the higher the resolution, the higher detail it can capture. The new Xbox that's coming out um, in the Christmas 2013, it's, it's going to blow your minds. And don't be afraid of it, because people like you can sit down and learn this stuff. And if you don't want to learn, you can hire capable people of doing this here in Houston, or in Kansas City, or in Seattle, or Tokyo, or wherever you're at. Technology's going fast, but it's doable. Two weeks. That's all this. Two weeks. And we're 3D guys. You know, if we had a programmer on top of it that was at our side, and we say, hey, we need this feature, and this feature, and this feature, and they can program it in. So you're going to start seeing programmers and 2D guys and 3D guys just like a film studio, just like a video game studio 
in the AEC market. Because if you don't start doing the real-time stuff and the iPad development, your company's going to get let be, it's going to get let go or get left behind. In your public involvement meeting, little Johnny's going to want to come to these now with mommy because he's going to know the Xbox and he's going to show mom how to get around. Hey mom, this is what it's going to look like from our house. We did a project that uh, they, were, they were worried about the sound barrier that was going up by the highway in Kansas City. Well, we, we could put the camera right there from their deck and look out and then they would have an advantage point exactly with AC. Is this going to impede your look? It's there, but you still can see across. And they're like, and they, they bought off on it. So these tools are very powerful in getting people to buy off on your projects. So I want to uh, close up with uh, recapping of everything we talked about. We talked about communication tools, 3D and 2D, uh, high-end animations, very expensive, two months, three months of development, high budgets, and then you have middle level, short about a month turnaround, so, you know, you can cut that budget in half. You can also do a lot of stuff in a week. You got photo matches, you got animated photo matches, and you got quick 3D animations that are very basic, rough, but they get the picture crossed. It's all depending on the life cycle of your project. Do you have time to do it? Yes, then, and the budget, let's go after something re very realistic and get that done. If not, there's no problem with doing animated photo match. Quick, simple, and all you need is a graphic designer and a, somebody who knows how to animate an object in 3D space. That's it. Photoshop, After Effects, and an animated object in Max or Maya, or even SketchUp. Uh, the next thing we talked about was um, how we're using these on h and in public involvement meetings, uh, how we're using them on showcasing 4D applications, especially during the design build projects. It's very important to have that on-site, uh, especially right now, we're working on the 405 out in Los Angeles. And each, each week, the construction team is getting an updated model from everything that's happened the previous weeks layered on top and they can they can scrub back in timeline this is what we did last week this is what we're going to do next week and then keep on if something changes the next week it's going to get that change and hopefully in development time that week turnaround is going to start being three days and then daily as technology like this improves and everybody's workflows improve you're going to have overnight uh, updates on big projects we also talked about tools through our 3d team uh, we use 3D Studio Max as our, our main program. But like I said, get the, your team the tools they need that they already know. They're familiar with them. Don't worry about training them with something. That will come with time, but if they're really fast the Maya right out of college or from their old, old job, give them Maya. It can come in 3D Studio Max. Graphic designers, just like everybody knows, you need Adobe uh, products. It's a very essential to what they do. Photoshop. Illustrator, After Effects, Premiere if they're doing video. Um, if they're doing heavy video, we, we have a dedicated video team that uses Avid software and they do their own music and sound bits. So depending on which development you want to go, there's a lot of qualified people all over the country that do this stuff. Uh, last thing we talked about was, uh, or heavily talked about, was uh, the, our, pro, our uh, innovations. Really look at the, uh, figuring out what new softwares are coming out and stay ahead. Research and development. Look at the Connect. It's very powerful for doing interactivity. <laughs> also look at the uh, Xbox 360 uh, hardware or the P PS3. Um, they can do some powerful things as well. But all you need is a PC, a Mac, Android, and iPhone, and your game controller controls your scene. Well, thank you for attending, guys, and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Austin, for that was a lot of good information. Um, I'm going to go straight to the bottom line, which is the cost for the immersive mm -hmm. model there. Um, kind of have, can you give me some range of cost? And also, if you give me um, on the multi-screen, uh -huh. cost on that. The cost are, uh, I'll start with the multi-screen. Okay. We're using, here, we good. The multi-screen uh, is, right now we're using Samsung. We're not using professional grade, we're using the top consumer grade. Mm -hmm. 
They're, fit, they're 50 uh, inches or the 56 inch model. Um, they're about $1,800 a piece. We have custom made uh, uh, easels that support them. Um, we use Keynote to power them uh, for our presentations. And then from that, we can hook up our interactive uh, software and turn their flat static HDTVs and they become uh, interactive. So If you, if you would hire us, the TVs are included in the price. Um, for the animation itself, uh, the last one I showed, uh, the VIA, which is a light rail uh, for Alamo, took two of us two months, and it cost roughly about $50,000 because we had the investment time in that. Um, the 2D stuff um, is typically uh, in the same ballpark but they, they're generally with the whole life cycle. Whereas we come in towards the middle, where the, where, cause we're, my job is mainly going after the pursuits and the client-led stuff, whereas the 2D designers, they're from proposal all the way through the project. So I can't really speak on the 2D side of things, but the 3D cast, I can. How about the MRSA? The MRSA model, actually, when it's done, 3D Studio Max, um, we can bring it over here with some cleanup. It's a, instead of having the animation, it's going to be roughly about the same cost. Really? So instead of having the animation, we focus our time on the immersive model. And it's one of the same price range? Same price have. range. Okay. Right. Yeah, because once it's done in 3D, it's, it, you can take it anywhere. You can take it to a 3D print uh, like that. You can bring it to the immersive model. You can render it. So the, the heavy lifting is inside of 3D Studio Max. Now, the costs really, really go up real quick when all this stuff is static, like I was talking about how to use Google and create a thing from scratch. But if we have existing models already built that we can get from, uh, a, lot, a lot of times, like we worked for a project on uh, light rail for downtown Indianapolis a few years back. And their local architecture, the AIG, uh, had a model. And they gave us a whole downtown Indianapolis. Well, that just cut you know, ha half our budget because it's already done. And then we just worked with MDOT uh, to uh, do the uh, Boston Terminal that has light rail, bus, uh, South Station, the South Station project. And they had, um, I don't know if it was Boston University or somebody actually created the whole, I mean, all of Boston and for free. And they gave it to us. And we were able to use that as our foundation. And then we were able to add textures to it and realism to it you know, half the cost because that works, the heavy lifting has been done. Currently we're working on a project right now. Typically the bigger cities, somebody's out there's already done it. Los Angeles, London, Boston. So you just got to go out and find it and uh, allow us to save uh, a lot of money, save you a lot of money. Sure. But you just got, people just need to know where it's at and go look for it. Mm -hmm. How did that kind of vary decision to kind of want to connect to our code? Then it's Z Corp actually has a good uh, handheld scanner, the same company that does a, uh, 3D printing. Uh, we also have teamed up with uh, a company that does a lot of our actual real big landscaping LiDAR. But if we need something quick and easy, uh, the Connect, um, it's, it's not at a stage yet where we can fully use it yet, but it's getting there. So if we need to just drive down, down the street and you know get this, you know old building or something that's going to get demoed, and we can do that, scan it in, and hopefully capture some data with it, textures with it, and apply that, it will do just instead of doing everything by hand, we'll let the Connect do the work. So Connect's very very small scale. Actually, a lot of universities are actually using it right now for architectural digs in Egypt and Rome and everywhere. They're, they're finding these old. Uh, things and actually be, take them down the catacombs and using the connect to uh, get some of the stuff. So the some of the stuff that's going on with the connect is really mind-boggling. Uh, since, since you presented an actual project that is here very visible, mm -hmm. the 290, uh, could you just describe the process since Mike is here and uh, can you go over how <coughs> How long, how, you know, how many people? 
the original uh, 290 project um, was the three guys in our Dallas office that did the visualization. When they were done with it this last summer, I called them up three weeks ago and said, uh, we've been asked to come present to you guys today. And we want to do a project showing our new technology to them to show them it's very feasible to do it. So we took their existing data, which took them probably two and a half, three months. I think it was about three months. About three months to uh, do the whole Whataburger and Hilton and everything. So that was three months of their time and then two weeks of our time. And then we, you know, we don't have all the textures and stuff for the buildings the details, yet. Details, though, are like, for instance, there's a, it's not new anymore, but at 18th Street, 610 North Mount Frontage Road and 18th is a loft building called Broadstone Lofts. When the original area, when the original animation was done, that wasn't in there, they put it in there. And folks noticed that. Yeah. Well, hey, there's the lofts. But you said they started with CAD and then moved into 3DS? Correct. A lot of the times I would like to have the engineers and architects on board from the get go so I can start working on the existing stuff because the existing stuff nobody wants to do. So, th so this project started with uh, some, in some engineers that did the CAD model? Correct. All of our terrain model and stuff, we use uh, En-ROADS through MicroStation. And uh, so the engineers are off working on the terrain and stuff because we got to need to know the slopes for fill and all that good stuff. So we bring the fill in and then we match it up with the existing stuff and then we actually have the engineers who are working on the proposed stuff and they're designing that in whatever software that they feel most comfortable. And then we take that and we import it in 3D Studio Max using uh, FBX for taking a Revit model or we'll bring it in as an AutoCAD file and then we'll start working the base file off that. So the three months was just was after the CAD models for our the CAD models. How my team works? Three months is, is typically working with engineers at the same time. So our cost is with engineers' cost, or the architect's cost, depending on what kind of project we're working on. Correct. Correct. That's where like the existing stuff is. So we get on being Google Earth. Um, I mean, we bring the aerial image in. We figure out where the project is. We make that zero 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 and. and in uh, 3D space, and then we'll start outlining buildings and get rough shapes in. And if it's the building is off from the camera, it's going to be seen. We'll just leave it as a block and have a just rudimentary uh, texture that we can get off and we'll photo, you know, place it on there. But if it's going to be right there by the camera, we'll go in and we'll we'll model the you know the, the mullions, the window sills, the doors. Um, if a tree is right there, we'll make sure we have a tree right there. And if there's a guardrail, we'll make sure there's a guardrail right there. So it's just a, it's where the camera's at, and that's where we focus our detail. A lot of the times is when we get, talk to a client, they don't know. They got this big product site. They don't know what they want to focus on. They want to focus on a mile of it, or they want to focus on the whole 45-mile corridor or 90-mile corridor. So we kind of tell them what they should look at. And if they, if they really want to go high detail, I'll say, let's focus on about two to three miles. In this case, you just focus on the main interchange, right? So, right. and they put all the detail around the interchange. Google Earth is in my first five minutes of every project. I have to go to Google Earth and uh, section off a square mile or how many square miles I need of aerial imagery, and I save that uh, KMZ file and I send it off to uh, Global uh, or uh, MapMart. The, uh, the company that was with Global Mapper, and they'll take the actual area that I selected in Google Earth, and they'll give me uh, six inch resolution. It's typically from them. Uh, we use Microsoft. They have two variants of six inch. Uh, six inches uh, per pixel. It's probably high detail right now. So the, the lower the resolution, because there's one foot and six inches, the lower the uh, resolution, uh, six inch, I'm going to have more detail. So when I zoom in, it's not going to break up as bad. But if it's like one foot or three meter that you sometimes can get free from NASA or whoever, it doesn't look very good. So yes, Google Earth is used first five minutes. I save out that file. I send it out to a third party, Map, Map Mark. They give us aerial imagery in a day or two. Sometimes it's a quick turnaround, depending on if they have it. Or if not, they have to order it, and it'll get shipped to them, or they'll have to download it to FTP, and they send it to us. But they're really efficient and it's quick, and we try to go six-inch resolution. 
So Google Earth is used. They're slight problem. Um, they typically do the big cities first. And a lot of times when you work out in rural areas, they don't have it. So if you're downtown Houston, they probably have six inch and they probably have it. My best guess they probably the latest they have is probably 2010. It's all depending on uh, how, I don't know how, the, how they determine, but some cities it's uh, the cities say, hey, we got big products, so I want you to come fly it, and they'll come out and fly it. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, the city is contacting the, the Microsoft or whoever does the aerial photography in the area to come out and fly it. But yeah, right now the, the next, next wave is three inch, and it's, it's awesome. But it, it takes a lot of uh, effort to get in side, inside of 3D Studio Max without yelling at your computer a lot. Any other questions in the back? So does your firm consider this the standard approach to public outreach now, or is this something that an agency would have to specify in its request to you? Uh, right now, after showing this to the CEO when he stopped by, um, and him, the chief sales officer, which uh, is my boss's boss, and after hearing about the 14 days of rendering and showing this, this is what we did in two weeks, he likes this a lot. And when I get back home, I think we're going this route, nonstop. So it, it, I think it's something that if you're the client, you're going to have to start, you, you will start asking for it because you'll see a noticeable difference. You're going to lose some detail because you can't get the high poly trees, the really cool looking trees and everything, but it's interactive. And people are coming to an interactive state where you can go to your website and somebody can download to their iPad or, or their iPhone or their Android or their BlackBerry tablet. It, I, think, I think it's really going to catch on. There is more cost associated with this right now, but turnaround time, I think that's going to make up for it. Because right now our render farm, we have 20 machines. Each machine is about $6,000 and that's a three year lease. So you're sitting on old technology within two months of you buying it. So what you just dropped all that money, we can continually, these guys, uh, this company uh, is out of Germany and every five months they gotta continue getting better and better because they got competition in the game industry on their heels. So does that answer your question? You're going to have to start asking for it. But from my company's perspective, I think I'm going to start getting, this is what we need to look at. So right now, a lot of people don't know about it because they, they still think that this is what Johnny's doing in the living room that has no, it's a toy, you know, it's a video game. It, there's no place for it in the AEC market. But it's no different than an animation looping of US 290 on your website. So. As people get more interactive and more connected with everything, it, it's definitely, in my opinion, the way to go. But you need some savvy people to, to, to get it done. Any other questions? Austin, I, I just had a question. Yeah. <laughs> this is, you were able to take our animation and make this <coughs> rendering based on Yeah, that. We, we took the 3D Studio Max files. Because I think I see where you are in here, I, I think. Yeah, we can, uh, if somebody wants to get down and, and come and play, play standard controls, if you play uh, games like Call of Duty. But, yeah, we can control time of day, snow, rain, fog, clouds, tornadoes, um, that kind of stuff. We had no control over yeah, before. Road, road debris. We can do road debris. Actually, there is road debris. Uh, we took the existing terrain and then we uh, dropped the proposed roads on top and there's places where uh, we didn't have time to cut them out yet. Uh, so, so, but it's easy, easy fix. Hazmat spills? The what? Hazmat spills? It, you, possibly, yeah. I mean, it, 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 
there's that's the big ramp. But yeah, anybody's more than welcome to come here and, 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 and test drive here. What is that? How does that control? So this goes backwards, left, tr left trigger, right trigger is gas, and then joysticks turn. And then if you want a more better perspective here. Or you can spin. This is how you spin. There you go. And dash. There you go. Oh. There you go. That's it right here. Ah. There you go. Right. So and then your ga gases go. And the joystick here, it turns your car. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. IED. But yeah, we, we can get rid of the tanks. We can put in real cars. Uh, we're actually looking at how to get our VizSim data into this so we can actually have, you're going to get too far and go off to no man's land. Yeah. You crashed. That is, yeah. I see which where you are, though. But yeah. Yeah. That, that uh, now you, you, you found the water. Going to 10 and then a ramp coming from 10. And then there, and there's like a little lake over there somewhere. You're in the water. You're in it. Oh, wow. That is so cool. But you better get out because you're not going to have pleasant thoughts here in a little bit. <laughs> But yeah, all this stuff is it's built in this way because it's a game engine, but we can take, Ouch. before the public involvement meeting happens. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, I'm sad that I'm underwater. Yeah, but, but we can take out the blood and the guts and all that good stuff and we'll just tailor to your needs. It's, I mean, it's, it's cool what it is. And everybody always has that question when we're at these meetings. Does it have a gun? So we're like, well, all right, we'll keep the guns in. <laughs> So, but you are the first group that's uh, seen this, and it's only two two weeks in the development, and we're using off-the-shelf software. This would draw a huge response. Yeah. So. One more question. We had the rocket launcher. We took it out, though. It does some really cool stuff. Don't stand too close. Let's give Austin a round of applause. We thank you for your attendance. Um, we, at the same time, we're inviting you to our upcoming round.